global webinar in the context of the Joanna Jackson Mood Group Competition, the 90th edition. So it's starting already to be to be um, historical at this point, uh, barely. And uh, the goal of this event from which the topic is uh, revitalizing the WTO rules-based system so we can address global challenges focused on the European perspective. And the goal of this event is to, to, to talk a bit more on the broader aspect of the WTO rules-based system in general, not only focusing on the, on the case of the competition, but also to allow the, the, the participants as well as the other students to discover a bit more and to, to dig a bit more in the topic and to help a bit the next potential generation of uh, trade law experts to discover a bit more the topic, to learn about it and to be able to have um, a broader perspective. So in this context, uh, with, with an, uh, following an idea of, of Professor Ramirez for Bless My Bad, um, we, we, we decided to organize a series, a series of webinars, uh, starting with the All-American one and uh, focused for, or for the perspective of each of the regions. This one is the second, and it's my great pleasure to, to, to welcome everyone to, to this webinar. On the technical notes, uh, I will put in the chat some forms for us to, to get some data about the person that are actually watching uh, here or on the different live streams that we are that we are having on, on the platforms uh, to have some data about the, the attendees uh, for us to be able to, to adapt a bit the content in the future editions. Um, and, um, and this being said, I, will, I would like to, to say a big thanks in the name of Elsa to the Universidad de Guadalajara the Campus Cucosta, represented, of course, by, by, by Professor Ramirez Robles, which is, as I said before, the author of the concept. She will be obviously the moderator of this session, and I leave her the floor. Thanks a lot for everything. Thank you very much, Luis. And again, I would like to thank uh, Elsa, specifically to you, Luis, uh, and your team as well for your commitment and courage in managing this competition uh, and assisting to different uh, the different tasks that are involved to organize this um, uh, these global webinars and obviously I need to uh, thank and express my gratitude to the University of Guadalajara to the, from the general rector Dr. Ricardo Villanueva Lomeli, Carlos, uh, el Dr. Uh, Carlos Ivan Moreno Arellano, el Dr. Jorge Tellez Lopez, who is our um, rector of the center. Uh, of this campus, Puerto Vallarta, and obviously the director of the law faculty, uh, Dr. Uh, Marco Gonzalez Mora, and for all the team, obviously for Edgar that is there, uh, and is going to help us uh, with uh, with this uh, with in conducting this uh, global webinars, and to all the technical team that has done a, a tremendous job. So. Uh, I would also like to express my deepest gratitude to our speakers. Uh, and our special rapporteur uh, of this webinar, which is titled Revitalizing the World Trade Organization Rules-Based System so it can address global challenges. And we're going to review a European perspective. Today, we have a tremendously prestigious group of experts that have dealt directly with international trade issues for their entire careers and have developed a strong leadership worldwide. It is my true honor to introduce our speakers and rapporteur. Professor Sacerdoti is a former WTO appellate body member with more than 30 years of professional experience in international trade uh, law and international commercial and investment arbitration, predominantly as an independent arbitrator based in Milan, formerly Council of Evershell Ships. He is on the IXIT official arbitrators list and has been appointed, appointed as chair or member of arbitral tribunals in a number of sensitive investment arbitrations. Professor Sacerdoti is a prolific author in his field and teaches arbitration in international trade and investment law as emeritus professor at the Bocconi University of Milan. Ambassador Joao Aguiar Machado. Ambassador Aguiar Machado is the permanent representative of the European Union to the World Trade Organization in Geneva since October 2019. Before taking up this current position, Mr. Aguiar Machado was the Director General for Maritime Policy and Fisheries 
at the European Commission Brussels since 2015. From 2014 to August 2015, he served as Director General of Mobility and Transport at the European Commission. He has 16 years of experience working on trade policy and external relations, where he served as Deputy Director General at the Director General for Trade at the European Commission. He studied economics, both in Lisbon and College of Europe, uh, Bruges, Belgium. Philippe Debar, Debaré, <laughs> people tend to pronounce it in a French way, <laughs> uh, joined Banvel and Bellis in 1988 and is currently its managing partner. Prior to joining Banvel and Bellis, he worked as research fellow on international trade law at the University of Leuven. He focuses on EU and WTO trade law, as well as EU customs law and expert controls. Philippe has been involved in most major EU anti-dumping, anti-circumvention, and anti-subsidies proceedings since 1990, 1990. He represents clients before the European Commission, the EU General Court, the EU Court of Justice, WTO panels, and WTO appellate body, or former appellate body. Um, Pinar Artiran. Dr. Tiran is a WTO chairholder and director of the Research Center for International Trade Law at the Faculty of Law at BG University in Istanbul, Turkey. She has taught at LLMs such as Yelpo, Melbourne Law School, and the University of Toulouse. Dr. Artiran acted as legal expert for the revision of Turkey EU Customs Union Agreement commissioned by the European Commission. She was academic coordinator for the regional trade policy courses organized for government officials from center, Central and Eastern Europe, Central Asia and Caucasus, Caucasus countries by the WTO between 2010 and 2015. She also coached Turkish teams to participate in the El Samut Court on WTO law, and these teams have made it to the final. Uh, then, Eva Maria Cavalera Fernandez, Deputy Head of Unit for the Latin American Unit in DG Trade of the European Commission. She is in charge of managing the trade relations between the EU and Latin America. Previously, she was negotiator for the Mexico and Mercosur agreements, in addition to having worked as lawyer in the legal department for DG Trade from 2013 to 2018 in the legal department of DG Customs and Taxation from 2010 to 2013 and in the appellate body of the World Trade Organization in 2008. So without uh, further uh, preamble, I'm gonna proceed to set the scene uh, for this webinar. Uh, we all know that the WTO faces significant challenges that have deeply affected its ability to carry out its core functions. First, although the Doha round began with much promise and ministers reached a negotiation package in July 2008, the only major development or new agreement has been the Trade Facilitation Agreement, which was concluded in Bali in 2013 and entered into force in 2017. Negotiations on e-commerce, extended services coverage, investment facilitation and fisheries subsidies are ongoing but have yet to produce results. Second, members have complained about aspects in the dispute settlement system, including judicial activism since the earliest days. The United States refusal to appoint new members to the appellate body as their terms expired resulted in rendering it in a tile of the end of by the end of 2019. In addition to the existing challenges of the WTO itself, our global challenges that need the organization must play a role in addressing. These go from pandemics, starting from the COVID-19, antimicrobial resistance, climate change, threat from new and emerging technologies, ecosystem collapse, 
food security, etc. Although the WTO relies on a highly qualified secretariat, it is a member-driven organization, and these hardness must be addressed by the members. Consensus has been reached for a new director general in 2021, the newly director general appointed, Dr. Nosi Okonjo Iweala, noted that the organization needs to look for a sense of progress as well as to work and perceive itself in a global context without ignoring long-term and sustainable goals. The WTO cannot consider its work in isolation. For the WTO to make the greatest contribution possible to the progress of sustainable development goals, it will need deep reform to revitalize the rules-based system. This will only be possible to achieve through an intensive level of cooperation in all sectors. These webinars seek to discuss and provide food for thought to find WTO feasible, flexible, and inclusive reforms. In the various webinars, speakers will present their views on how to revitalize the WTO rules-based system, while presenters will be guided aiming to find responses to the following questions. What are the global challenges that have impacted and will impact the most in your region? How can the WTO rules-based system address these challenges? What are the missing elements to strengthen the WTO rules-based system that would need these global challenges? Why this rules-based system and the WTO are critical in order to address these challenges? And fifth, how can the WTO members of your region revitalize the WTO rules-based system? This second global webinar will provide a European perspective, although finding regional solutions for global challenges seems to be tough to start, uh, a tough start for some regions. And this is not the case for the European Union. The EU has led initiatives, such as the multi-party interim uh, arrangement, like the, uh, which is called or known as the MPIA, the Trade and Health Initiative that calls members to make their utmost efforts to prevent further disruptions in the supply chains of essential medical goods, and the open, uh, sustainable, and assertive EU trade strategy, which uh, is known internally at the EU as the TPR. Uh, that deals with SMEs, sustainable and climate, open strategic autonomy, digital trade, and obviously a WTO reform, and an implementation and enforcement. So without further preamble, I would like to give the floor to Professor Giorgio Sacerdoti. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. I have known Elsa for a long time. I was a judge at the finals in Geneva, I think it was 2007 and so. And it's very good that this mostly student young people organization tackle uh, these problems. Uh, what can we say? I will try also European non-official perspective, of course. I, I think a good basis is that all uh, countries, major countries like the G20 member, uh, support the multilateral trading system. Maybe they don't act always uh, in compatibility with this uh, statements, but they consider generally that uh, a multilateral framework as was established 25 years ago, basing on GATT, uh, is still valuable, it's important and should be revitalized. Uh, I would recall, and you have done it, uh, Edna, that the WTO system has been under strain, has been somehow on hold. That was basically the inability of members to resolve a friction from uh, emerging in relation to the application of existing rules. First of all, procedural notification, transparency, dispute settlement, recourse to purely lateral and also a different view on substantive discipline and the need of change, the adequacy, like subsidies, state-owned enterprise, 
and then the little engagement to negotiate new rules uh, since the uh, existing rule book dates back from the mid 90s like fisheries e-commerce and so and i would say uh, this has been also shown by the fact that very many members among the most important have pursued the other avenue we have had the unilateralism the protectionism clearly of the trump administration. Uh, we have also have built bilateral deals and regional agreements that have expanded on the rule book of the WTO because uh, it was impossible to, to get new rules there, but also have not have much regard on the limits of Article 24 for regional trading. Uh, the plurilateral agreement avenue has been explored, but the efforts had been stuck there too. Uh, we have had the bilateral, the mega regional, the reform of the, let's say, of NAFTA. Uh, I would point out to, to an aspect on which I have devoted some attention, which I would call the politicization of trade relations. I think the idea of GATT and the WTO was that normal trade relations should somehow be isolated from the political vagaries of relations between countries. Only in extreme cases, let's say, uh, uh, war and similar international emergency, Article 21 would allow uh, renegating on commitments. And also the needs of the domestic economy, safeguard, anti-dumping, anti-countervailing duties, uh, has been constrained by procedural rules, but the need to be objective and not discriminatory. Now, this has been somehow abandoned in, in, in recent years, not by all countries, surely by the US, but also, but also there has been a clear disregard of this limit. Article 21, which had been very rarely invocated in 70 years, has now been invocated for any kind of things. Let's say the US, still the Trump administration has put a restriction on, on, uh, on the export from Hong Kong uh, to the US in reaction to the uh, well-known position of uh, poli po uh, political and police government in Hong Kong. And this has been in the last DSP justified by the US uh, under security reasons, emergency. Now, you, you, you might be able to justify this on saying maybe uh, uh, with this new Chinese legislation applicable in Hong Kong, uh, uh, the separate custom union does not exist anymore. But to invoke security reasons of the United States seems really very much uh, overstretched. We have had also restrictions not just against countries, but a new phenomenon against specific companies, against uh, Huawei because of the 5G, against semiconductors industries, not just export restriction, but also import restriction on the use of this product. This has disrupted supply chains, uh, Taiwan, China, Vietnam, the US, even the European car industry has suffered of a lack of semiconductors. And then, of course, we had had the restriction uh, due to COVID, the export restriction on sanitary device, and now more recently also on vaccines. It's true that even the EU has taken initiative, but last week Italy blocked the export of 250,000 doses of AstraZeneca, I think, or Pfizer, to Australia with the benediction of the European Commission, but at, because, and even the Prime Minister of Australia recognized that Italy is in a more serious uh, need than Australia. But at the same time, the Commission pleaded the EU to liberalize the export of these products, the vaccines, and the EU didn't do it. So in the left of cooperation and global dealing with this, you see you have a beg your neighbor counter restriction that frustrates the original aim. I think this is a kind of sign of the globalization that is subordinating liberalization of trade to domestic non-trade concerns and objectives. And this has been become important in, in new regional. We know that USMCA replacing NAFTA has 
has conditions on the salaries of the Mexican uh, employees of automotive companies. The EU has introduced bold conditionality for environment, for labor rights, adoption of the uh, uh, ILO core condition, uh, core um, uh, treaties, convention in our bilaterals. There have been a, a panel arbitrating a dispute on that recently with Korea. It has been introduced also somehow in the recent agreement on investment with China. Now, these things, of course, are new sensitivity. Uh, I don't say this is negative, but surely we risk fermentation and increased uh, litigiousness also at the WTO. Uh, I will, there are many proposals. I think one could say first, one could have issues concerning the current operation of the data. WTO, the management of the system. I would say this member driven organization has come to the limit when the members are unable because they have different view to agree. And we have the rule of consensus. We could go by majority, but the countries don't want. The secretary should become stronger. There should be more initiative. Maybe there should be more small committees, group of experts as another organization to make proposal and just relying on general committees for, for every country being uh, right since the beginning to enter hasn't led to anything. And I think this should be uh, thought again, the cooperation with civil society, non-stakeholders. So enhancing the support all of the secretariat, I think it's important. Also the TRPRM could be Reinforce not not just analysis by countries, but maybe reviews by issues. Then we come to the dispute settlement system. Now, I think the dispute settlement system is not made to deal with disputes which are highly political, which are contentious, where countries declare at the outset or maybe during the proceeding that they will not comply. Like, let's say the U.S. declared in the last case with Canada a technical case of countervailing. Uh, duties on uh, super calendar paper, which I confess I don't know very well what it means and what it is, that they will not comply with with uh, with the decision and the uh, and the ruling of the DSP because they consider that that appellate body was illegitimate. The system cannot handle it. It's based on good faith, on willingness to comply. So I think first. Consultation should be more robust, maybe more intervention with the secretariat uh, to try to settle disputes that can be settled. The panel system uh, process should be streamlined and accelerating. The US has attacked the delay beyond 90 days of the appellate body, but it's really the panel proceeding that takes years. It has been difficult to establish, to constitute panels, countries objecting. It's not so well known to the proposal of the secretary. It should be streamlined after a certain while, like at said if, if the parties don't agree on the panelists, then it's a DG decides and that's it. And then, of course, the appellate body, there has been proposal. Uh, I think the appellate body and most countries have considered they have done finally its job under the constraint it has. It's the only uh, international tribunal or body that has a 90 day uh, uh, deadline. The deadline, uh, if there are three things, it has been written on the main journal of, of three requirement on the main journal of international law. You want to have speed in the decision, you have quality in the decision, and you want to limit the cost. Now, you cannot have the three together. Uh, you want the speed, then you have to supply secondary means, full-time judges, adequate number. You prefer to have, if you prefer the speed, you prefer uh, uh, the, the quality, that's the same. You cannot have quality in little time. You prefer not to pay, and this system, the parties don't pay, it's easy to go, there is no filter, then you have lots of cases and you cannot have the two things. So there has been a proposal by Ambassador Walter, and this is a kind of fixing here and there the, the system to improve it. I think many countries think that's 
the good way along the line. Because you see, without an appellate body, and I will conclude here, you see the panel process is getting paralyzed. There have been seven panel reports this year. They have all been appealed in the vote. So there has been no decision after years and years of litigation in these seven cases. The respondent is not part of the MPA, has not accepted to agree to the MPA. So this very good initiative, I think, of, of the EU and other 22 countries is stuck there. And uh, the idea of having just one round, no appellate body, can work in a system which is bilateral or regional. I have been had the honor of being appointed in the first bilateral panel by the EU, EU under the bilateral agreement with Ukraine. There is, we were able to conclude it, notwithstanding the COVID, uh, in 11 months. Uh, and this is final. There has been an interim report. It copies the panel report. But of course, in a bilateral agreement, you have more cooperation between the two countries. And then it's not a precedent in any case. As the WTO, even if there is no legal value of precedent for the decision, and that's been recalled because the polemics have been unfair, of course, you look and how in a dispute between member A and B, uh, a certain provision has been interpreted because country D and F, if they will have another dispute further on, they look how that was decision. And you don't want decisions that go one way because if it's the respondent is US, you are nice to zeroing. If the respondent is China and let's say has a similar zeroing, then zeroing loses. So uh, the basic system has to be to be remade and given adequate adequate uh, uh, procedural rules. And also, I would say compliance has become very slow in recent years, also because this resistance of countries to comply voluntarily, and even this system of surveillance of countermeasures uh, is, is a zero-sum game. So some attention should be given also to this. I think I can stop here. I have put enough issues on the table. Thank you very much. We very much appreciate that you have put all these issues in the table we, uh, that uh, will be discussed um, in this, during this seminar. Thank you very much for your views. Uh, now, uh, we will, I, will, I would like to give the floor to Ambassador Joao Aguiar Machado, who is, as I said before, the permanent representative of the EU to the WTO. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I muted. I think now it's working. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you here this afternoon. Uh, and I will, uh, uh, in my presentation, follow more or less the, the structure of the questions, although probably not uh, in, in, the, in the exact order uh, that, uh, that was mentioned. Uh, well, I will start by saying, where are we coming from? And that reflects in our latest uh, policy paper that the European Commission issued on the 18th of February, uh, as you uh, refer to the trade policy review communication. And uh, I would start by referring to the back, background to that paper. Uh, we come from an era where there were already very tense geopolitical tensions uh, in the last few years. Uh, with an incre increasing uh, uh, tendency to adopt unilateral policies by the previous U.S. administration uh, and lack of engagement in the, in the WTO system. And uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a tremendous impact uh, on the economies of all of, uh, globally and of all members. And is coupled with a persisting crisis of the WTO system. Uh, so, uh, the European Commission has uh, then uh, used this occasion to reconsider, reassess uh, its trade policy uh, with the objective of making it uh, more uh, in tune 
with the current challenges that we are facing and put us in a better position uh, to address uh, the recovery once this pandemic starts to uh, fall out. Uh, and uh, 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 in that strategy document, uh, there are three keywords that I wanted to highlight. Uh, the first one is, uh, I mean, the keywords are open, uh, sustainability, and uh, uh, assertiveness. Open uh, because uh, the WTO system has served not only the European Union, but served uh, most of its members, I would say, extremely well. It has been uh, instrumental for our economic growth and prosperity uh, during the last decades. Uh, and the European Union being uh, the biggest trader, uh, we rely very much on the WTO system is vital uh, for our economic prosperity. And even if the European Union has in recent years been very active engaging in negotiations of bilateral free trade agreements or uh, regional trade agreements, as uh, uh, was indicated by Professor Sacerdoti, we have today uh, around 60, 46 uh, bilateral trade agreements covering 78 partners. Yet, the EU trade for two thirds is still governed by WTO rules. Our trade with US, with China, with India, with Russia, and even Brazil, because even if we concluded the Mercosur agreement is not yet in application. So two thirds of the EU trade is still conducted on WTO terms. That's why for us, it's crucial that we have a, 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 a WTO system that is, uh, that is vibrant, and that can address the challenges uh, that we are facing. So uh, the second uh, key word uh, in our uh, new policy is sustainability. The pandemic has accelerated the trend to more uh, digital economies. We have all experienced that, but also uh, accelerated the transition to the uh, green economies, to the climate neutral. Uh, economies, and there have been several countries, not only in the European Union, who have made commitments to climate neutrality by 2050. And uh, uh, this uh, will be a, a core uh, function of our trade policy as we move forward. And uh, finally, uh, assertiveness. Uh, in a nutshell, assertiveness means that the European Union will continue to engage multilaterally wherever possible, but we will not hesitate to do it bilaterally wherever necessary. Uh, and you uh, certainly have seen, and I can come back to that in detail, we have ad adopted an enforcement regulation precisely to deal to the fact that there is no appellate body and that there are uh, appeals into the void, as Professor Sacerdoti uh, mentioned. We have created a function of trade enforcement officer. We are adopting a number of legislation on uh, due diligence for companies to make sure that uh, they have no labor abuses or forced labor in their supply chains. We will be considering legislation on the impact of foreign subsidies in the EU single market. So there are a number. Uh, we are uh, reviving the discussion on international procurement instruments. So uh, we are reviving a number of tools that the EU will not hesitate to use if multilateral uh, discussions fail to produce results and in order that, that we defend our core interests. So uh, one of, uh, and we have seen that during the last years, uh, the European Union being so dependent on the multilateral trading system, uh, the WTO system has been in crisis. Uh, and uh, as you indicated, and Professor Sacerdoti as well, uh, it affects the three core functions of the WTO. First, the negotiating function. Uh, I will not repeat uh, what Professor Sacerdoti just said, but it suffices to say that it, it's. Uh, I don't think that a system can be viable when we are still working today on the basis of rules that were produced last century. 
we are still working on the basis of rules of the last century, 25 years ago. And uh, uh, it's inevitable that they do not reflect our economies work today, our enterprises operate today. So we are really behind. Uh, if, and uh, if you consider, for example, the fishery subsidies, it has been going on for 20 years. Uh, this is simple, they are simply untenable. And what will happen is if we continue this way, government will go more and more to negotiate elsewhere. Uh, and uh, uh, the, I think it will be a tremendous failure of the WTO system. Uh, so what are we proposing here? Uh, what we propose here is that we need to continue the discussion on what is special in differential treatment. You know, some of the problems is this complete entitlement that a group of members have to have a special and differential treatment that most of the times uh, implies a carve out from the rules. And uh, while this could have worked under the GATT system, where uh, you had around 10 economies uh, that were the manufacturing centers of the world economy, uh, and the majority of the developing countries were not manufacturing centers. Today, it cannot work when you have countries like India or others uh, that uh, still uh, invoke special and differential treatment, and you cannot find any political support either in the European Parliament or in US Congress or many other places for agreements that uh, are so lenient uh, on major emerging economies, and particularly the countries of the G20. So we need to continue with that discussion. It will not be easy because the majority of the WTO membership are developing countries, so to say. It's a self-election, but if, when you have a majority of the members that are developing countries and you propose to redefine what is a developing country and decisions are taken by consensus, you can see how difficult that can be uh, to solve that issue. So in parallel to that, what we want and what we are preconizing is that we need to have a serious discussion about plurilateral agreements and how to integrate plurilateral agreements into the WTO system. I mean, with 164 members, it's very difficult economically, but also politically, that all are synchronized at the same time. But we should not be prevented to have agreements with those that want to go faster, provided that you have a number of safeguards, for example, that these agreements or these negotiations are open to others who want to join. And when concluded, they are open to those who want to accede. Secondly, it should be clear that whatever is negotiated, like for example, on e-commerce negotiations should not impinge on the existing rights of non-participating countries. I think it's a basic principle that we have to have. Uh, you cannot have a group uh, deciding and negotiating on things that will uh, undermine the, the, rights, the existing rights of non-participating members. So we need to have a number of safeguards, uh, procedure safeguards, and uh, all the substantive ones. But at the end of the day, it should be possible for those countries who want to advance more rapidly that they should advance. Otherwise, we will never be able to address the, the, the current challenges, particularly if you speak about climate trade and climate change. Uh, it will be extremely difficult. Uh, so for, to revitalize the WTO, we need to revitalize the, the, the negotiating function. Secondly, we need to improve the workings of the institution uh, and we need to improve uh, the ability of the WTO Secretariat uh, to do uh, a number of other actions. When I say that, that we need to improve the workings of the institution, I am not in any way uh, implying criticisms on the work of WTO Secretariat. On the contrary, the Secretariat is not doing more because the members don't want it to do more. That's the reality. So if anything needs to change, it needs to change the software in the minds of the members. I mean, I find it 
uh, astonishing that, for example, now that we are in the middle of the pandemic and there are a number of measures being adopted by governments, that the membership does not want the WHO Secretariat to do reports on the basis of the information that is out there in the press and information that governments supply to the WTO, they just want information that is officially supplied by governments, which very often is incomplete or is late. But at the same time, these very same governments, the same first thing they do is to look at the reports coming out of the St. Gallen University, uh, the Trade Watch, uh, by uh, Professor Simon Evanet, because it has very up-to-date information. So, and we are not using the resources of the Secretariat to do that, but we are looking at Oxford or London School of Economics or to the St. Gallen for information about it. It makes no sense. Uh, we need to give more leeway to the WTO Secretariat to do this type of compilation and information. And finally, we need to rediscuss the dispute settlement. Obviously, uh, with a position that was taken by the United States, uh, it's a bi bipartisan position. So it's not something that is only the Trump administration. Uh, the United States has a number of grievances, uh, certainly uh, 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 colleagues like Professor Sacerdote and uh, Philippe de Bar, no much better. The United States has never accepted any international jurisdiction other than the WTO. They are you not know, part of the criminal court. They have never accepted human rights uh, court. So uh, the United States, this is the only example. And uh, we see that this only example for them was too much to swallow. Was too much to swallow, particularly on the trade defense cap. Uh, because uh, that was the origin of all the grievances with the US. So we need to find a way, uh, and we are ready. Of course, the new USTR is not yet confirmed, so we, can, we have not yet had occasion to engage with the new administration on this, but the message is that the European Union is passing it. We are ready to engage. We are ready to be bold, but we need to ob observe some key principles. And for the European Union, there are two, three key principles. First, that whatever comes out of the dispute settlement is binding, meaning that we don't touch on negative consensus. Secondly, that they need to be done by people who are independent and impartial. And thirdly, the two stage uh, with an appeal. Uh, of course, this appeal, the appellate body has its own history. And uh, sometimes people ask, why are you, are you so attached to the appellate body? Because the, 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 the deal that was made in the, in the Uruguay round was to, preserve, to keep the panel, but the panel is essentially a semi-diplomatic way of arbitration. And uh, in order to, have, for, to be binding, we needed to have the security that the rulings were of high quality. So we created the appellate body. And now, uh, uh, including the United States says, but after all, the panels are not working that bad. Well, the panels have improved, but thanks to the appellate body being there, because the appellate body being there put an handle on the way the panels used to, to work. So we need to have a discussion about this with the US. Should we preserve the two stage or not? But if we don't preserve, then we need to review the first stage completely. And the risk here is that we engage in a long discussion that can take years to conclude again. But we hope that uh, we can find a way with US. I don't think that we will see a reestablishment uh, in the near, in near or short term. But I think in one, two years, it could be possible to have an agreement with the US. I think I've overdone my time. I would stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have more ideas. We have more. Uh, it, it is um, incredible to hear, I mean, the, the clearness that the EU has in terms of their policy. And I think it's going to be a very key player for the next, for revitalizing precisely the, the rules-based system. So now uh, I will give the floor to Mr. Philippe de Varé. Uh, 
Thank you, Edna, and thank you, Luis, uh, for inviting me to participate in this panel together with uh, such eminent speakers. Uh, as you know, Van Baal and Bellis is a big fan of the Elsa Moodcourt competition, and uh, for many, many years we have uh, been supporting this initiative, and I hope that we will be able to do it for many years more. Um, the advantage of coming after Professor Sacerdoti and Ambassador Machado is obviously that uh, uh, I can only share the views that they have expressed previously and that it becomes unavoidable that I will have to repeat certain points. Um, I will seek my refuge in history, therefore, and allow me, therefore, to take a step back in an effort to place the current discussions in a more historical perspective. In my view, the most, the single most important challenge is the breakdown of the multilateral rules-based trading system. And this as a result of a fundamental change in geopolitical power relations. Only five years ago, the consensus that free trade was an engine for creation of wealth and peace among nations was universally shared, was really a dominant consensus. Uh, we had for many years the references to the theory of comparative advantage of Ricardo, whereby that uh, free trade was an economic win-win and uh, everybody got better off by focusing on what and doing what we were good at. Moreover, and already pointed out at the time by Montesquieu, nations that were interlinked by mutually beneficial trading relations were less likely to engage in military conflict to obtain access to raw materials or foreign markets. To a certain extent, the creation of the GATT was the embodiment of this post-war consensus. The application of the, multi uh, of the most favored nation and national treatment principles ensured that at least the URE, all parties benefited from trade liberalization, irrespective of their economic or political weight. As already mentioned, trade conflicts were submitted to technical experts rather than escalated to the political or military sphere. Free trade, and we were all in agreement with that, free trade had also negative effects, for instance, effects on the environment, on the relative distribution of the increased wealth. Well, certain industries were winners, others were losers, but these were generally seen as manageable. manageable. Uh, they could be addressed within the system which put free trade first. Following the end of the Cold War, the US felt confident enough to accept the mandatory and binding jurisdiction of the WTO dispute settlement body. As Zhao mentioned, the only instance where the US accepted such mandatory jurisdiction, not for the International Court of Justice, not for the International Criminal Court, no other court uh, is where, uh, exists where the US uh, accepted mandatory jurisdiction and also the binding force of any decision adopted by this jurisdiction. In my view, this was only possible because the US considered that the conclusion of the Marrakesh Agreement would help spreading market economy principles and, by implication, liberal democracy to the countries of the former Soviet Union and eventually China. In that sense, the GATT and later the WTO always had a geopolitical function namely to promote Western liberal principles to the rest of the world. It could be seen as a tool to maintain the dominance of Western economic and political uh, and a political worldview. I think uh, an infamous example uh, is the role played by the Quad uh, in the creation of the WTO, uh, where we have seen that uh, four big Western or Western uh, economic and liberal democracies uh, basically put together the basis for the Marrakesh agreements and then exported it to the other uh, areas of the world. Unfortunately for the US at least, the end of the Cold War was not the end of history, to quote uh, Francis Fukuyama. Uh, we all know that neither China nor Russia have adopted market economies and certainly have not involve, evolved into liberal democracies. On the contrary, China, following its accession to the WTO, rapidly evolved into a trading superpower on the basis of a state-centered economic model that is increasingly presented as an alternative to the market-based models of economic development. The fact that China has used the multilateral trading system to become a potential strategic rival to the US 
has meant that from a geopolitical viewpoint, free trade is no longer seen as a win-win, but rather as a zero-sum game. What China gains is the US's loss. This has important implications for the multilateral rules-based trading system and the WTO in particular. The US is for the first time in its history confronted with a rival having the potential to match both its economic and its strategic power in the near future. For the US, the role played by the WTO in this development can be seen as negative in at least three ways. First, China's accession to the WTO has enabled it to become a global trading power. Moreover, this was done on the basis of an illiberal state-centered economic model. The WTO has therefore failed in its mission to promote Western economic and political models. Second, the WTO has been unable to address a number of practices seen as unfair by the West. China has generally complied well with the existing WTO agreements and has a high compliance rate with dispute settlement recommendations. There is, however, a general feeling that new rules are necessary to address distortions resulting from China's economic model. Third, the US increasingly sees the WTO, and in particular, its dispute, its dispute settlement mechanism, as a constraint on its ability to counter the emergence of China as a strategic rival and as a tool to stop the decline of its industrial base. Needless to say, as Zhao already pointed out, the main power that stands to lose from the erosion of the multilateral rules-based trading system is the European Union. The EU is an economic power, but a geopolitical dwarf. The politicization of international trade, sometimes referred to as geoeconomics, therefore reduces the power of the EU to make and enforce international trade rules. It is therefore essential that the EU makes all possible efforts to ensure the restoration of the multilateral rules-based system. And I was very pleased to see that the European Commission's recent communication on an open, sustainable and assertive trade policy is accompanied by an annex on the reform of the WTO, which is almost as long as the communication itself. So to quote Lenin, what is to be done? I believe we should start from the premise that no solution will be possible without addressing the geopolitical concerns of the US. The US should again see the WTO as a useful instrument to maintain and protect its economic and political interests. This implies that the WTO must undergo a fundamental reform. The reform of the dispute settlement mechanism is part of this, but it's in my view not a key element. The main challenge is to find a new equilibrium between the quasi-judicial, legislative, and executive functions of the WTO. And this requires first and foremost a revitalization of the legislative role of the WTO in order to make it fit better the economic and political challenges of the present. What does this imply more concretely? In my view, we should work towards, and I will list a few suggestions, certainly new agreements addressing digital trade, environmental goods and services, as well as climate change. As previous speakers already pointed out, the WTO is working on the basis of a rule book uh, from a time when we didn't even have internet. Uh, so we need to update these agreements to current concerns. We need new disciplines. Anti-dumping, anti-subsidy safeguards are no longer fit for the current trading environment. We need new disciplines on industrial subsidies and state-owned enterprises in order to ensure competitive neutrality. And to quote a term from, from the Brexit saga, we need to make sure that uh, there is a level playing field between market economies and state-run economies. We need a more equal sharing of rights and obligations among WTO members for instance, through a reset of the SND, SND treatment, the special and differential treatment already mentioned also by Zhao. This may require that we introduce a system of graduation 
for a number of developing country members such as China. And finally, I think that's very important if you want to find a solution for the crisis of the dispute settlement body, we need to facilitate the adoption of authoritative interpretations by the membership. Such reforms will solve to a large extent the stated US concerns with the dispute settlement mechanism. Misgivings about the appellate body rulings on unforeseen developments in the safeguard agreement, zeroing and anti-dumping agreement, or public body in the anti-subsidy and countervailing measures uh, agreement can be addressed by authoritative interpretations. If the membership is not happy with it, nothing prevents them to adopt an authoritative interpretation correcting what is perceived as the errors of the appellate body. In addition, to avoid further errors, we could have a system of legislative remand, whereby the appellate body actually refers questions to the membership for an opinion. The adoption of new WTO agreements will better address current trade problems, and therefore it will reduce the need for judicial activism, because have pity with these arbitrators and with the appellate body members who have to deal about green subsidies uh, and help to fit in tariffs and so on uh, in the context of agreements which were negotiated in the 80s, 90s. And we can make a number of procedural improvements, such as an increased emphasis on judicial economy, what I would certainly favor the introduction of page limits on submissions, and the appointment of adjudicators more focused on problem solving than on academic interpretation. Sometimes I've had the impression that uh, appellate body reports actually were read as an academic treatise. Uh, so we should try to reduce the obiter dicta and focus on what is necessary to give an answer to the parties. Essential, however, is that we maintain the two-tier appeal system, the negative consensus rule, and that we safeguard the independence of the adjudicators. Otherwise, I believe we can discuss about many things. Now, this is my wish list. It's obviously clear that the above reforms have little chance of succeeding under the current decision-making process, which requires consensus for most, if not all, of the above reforms. The question, therefore, becomes how do we convince China, India, and other major trading nations to support WTO reform? In my view, this will only be possible where they become convinced that they will lose out under the status quo and conversely may benefit from reform. Now, what can the EU do to make this happen? And I have five suggestions. So first, I believe that the EU must realize that it has not sufficient geopolitical weight to convince large WTO members to accept reform. It must build alliances to bring enough pressure in favor of reform. And this necessarily requires close cooperation with the US, but also with other like-minded members, such as, for instance, Japan and the UK. The trilateral discussions are on industrial subsidies are a good example of the approach that could be followed. Second, the EU should not hesitate to enter into plurilateral agreements where consensus among the membership is not feasible. We should not be afraid of a WTO a geometry variable. Such plurilaterals, as already mentioned also by Ambassador Machado, should be open to all members who are willing to fully undertake the resulting obligations. If necessary, phase-in periods and financial assistance could be considered. But there should, however, no permanent, be no permanent free riders. Plurilaterals, plurilaterals must show the cost of non-agreement at the WTO level, because that you can see as a WTO member, you can get extra rights and extra benefits by joining and going further and accepting these WTO plurilateral agreements. And third, I believe that the EU should not hesitate to adopt domestic regulation where multilateral solutions are not reachable. Again, the purpose should be to show the cost of non-agreement. And I'm aware of the efforts taken by the EU, for instance, in, on its white paper uh, on third country subsidies, uh, the, the uh, efforts on the carbon border adjustment mechanism. So it is important that the EU as, a, as, a full, as an important trading nation, important market, is actually able to adopt domestic regula regulation, which comes at a cost to other WTO members. And the only way of reducing this cost is to enter into 
plurilateral negotiations. Fourth, the EU should be pragmatic in its approach towards its partners and not overload its trade agreements with non-trade objectives. If we want to build an alliance which is strong enough to put our values and our ideas and in the WTO, um, we cannot uh, overload these, these agreements with third countries about uh, with non-trade objectives. And uh, I'm fully aware of the importance of human rights and the importance of uh, uh, certain labor rights. Uh, but I believe there are other fora that could be used primarily to address these issues rather than making it almost impossible to conclude trade agreements uh, because the emphasis is too much put on these non-trade trade values. Fifth, and related to the previous point, the EU should not participate in a US approach aimed at isolating or containing China. China is an important trading partner and the EU should engage with China on the issues such as digital trade, investment, climate change, services, public health, etc. Uh, we should work with China where possible and without China where necessary. The geopolitical discussions between and fight between the US and China should not become a conflict driven by ideological differences. We don't need a new Cold War. In conclusion, reform will only be possible where WTO members become fully aware of the cost of non-reform and where the reform-minded members can show that they have the possibility to go forward with new agreements without the others. I believe that the EU's latest WTO reform proposal is a very good step in that direction. And I feel a little bit strange of being so unequivocal laudatory about the EU, given my uh, practice as a lawyer, but uh, this time I have to uh, recognize that. So thank you very much. And that was all I wanted to say. <laughs> Wonderful thoughts and recommendations. Thank you very much, Philippe. Um, now I will give the floor to Professor Pinar Artiran, the WTO chairholder of Turkey. Thank you. Or of the University uh, of uh, Bigli University Law Faculty. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edna, and thank you also, Louis, for the wonderful invitation. It's an honor for me to be here with Professor Sajar Toti, with Ambassador Machado, and dear Philip, of course, that I have known for so many years. After having such wonderful speakers, of course, it's going to be quite a bit of a challenge for me to say anything new, but I'll try to hopefully bring perhaps a little bit academic approach to what has been already said uh, on a number of occasions by the speakers on very important points. First of all, I would like to perhaps, you know, uh, pick up where uh, Philip uh, left and the idea of China to me the world trade organization in general and international trading system has a major problem to be solved between you know what those you know major players call as the strategic rival as china and the way the us looks at china and the european union looks at china so one of the important elements that i think you know the 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 problem that lays ahead is the idea of developing countries that I will try to mention in more detail in a couple of minutes. But before coming to that, I'm surprised that nobody, you know, mentioned the pandemic that we have been going through over the last year. And to me, for anyone in the world who would like to perhaps, you know, to relate himself or herself to a little bit with trade, I think we all lived in the impact of the COVID, not only for health reasons, but also for trading purposes. Many countries who were relying on the global supply chains were cut off from the global supply chains. We had major problems to export and import items. So to me, over the at least until MC12, one of the things that we will need to uh, address is how, first of all, we have this vaccine appetite, the global vaccine appetite that is, you know, leaving, you know, countries so much divided from each other and whether the WTO can do anything about it. So that's why I mean, I very much value the new uh, Director General Dr. Angozi's effort in trying to find a solution to this, you know, global vaccination, the COVAX initiative, and, you know, the way in which uh, the WTO could perhaps a role in playing against it, because I think if we do not touch upon the citizens around the globe, 
you know, if we do not find the people's vaccine, and because it is so important for trade as well, we may be of, you know, losing a little bit touch about the context. On the other side, apart from the uh, the vaccine, I think one of the other important elements of what I've seen at least, you know, at this part of the globe, you know, in my country, in Turkey, but elsewhere as well, the food scarcity, which was due to the uh, COVID-19 crisis as well. So we know that in the WTO, for agricultural subsidies and agricultural negotiations, those food stocks have been mentioned by a couple of you know, members. Therefore, one of the, uh, I think, implications of the COVID-19, not only that we need to, talk, to think about these health policies, and the vaccination and how to share the vaccine, but also how to, you know, face the idea of a right to food and how we can make sure that the countries remain sustainable in their lands. I think that's very important as well. And I think this is going to be another discussion matter for all of us. And one of the things that I always, I mean, when we are teaching the WTO law, we always say that the WTO is not an environmental organization and WTO is neither a development organization. And yet we know that even in the preamble, there's reference to sustainability, environmental protection. And we know this, you know, infamous article 20 general exception provision of the GATT has always been used for environmental reasons. And on the other hand, we know that there are lots of SNDT flexibilities which are embedded into the, you know, into the GATT and the covered agreements. Now, in, you know, when we are facing the COVID-19 crisis and when we know that so many countries are right now uh, subsidizing their companies and trying to be self-sufficient, you know, one wonders whether and what kind of interpretation now we will bring to the concept of national treatment. You know, one of the pillars of the international trading system, non-discrimination, whereby you're not supposed to discriminate between imported product and the domestic product. And yet during the COVID-19 crisis, we all have seen that all countries are trying to be self-sufficient. And one of the, you know, uh, Ambassador Matada rightly pointed out the European Union trade policy where they call it open strategic autonomy to me this concept in itself includes a couple of controversies because from one side we're trying to be open multilateral but to the extent it is necessary for the european union they will try to be autonomous so that's why i think one of the things that we will need to face in the negotiations phase of the of the world trade organization is to actually marry these two concepts. How can you, from one side, become, be multilateral and be involved in multilateral negotiations? And how, on the other hand, will you make sure that you will be strong, self-sufficient, and you will also be respectful to the national treatment principle? So from that angle, I think, you know, uh, it's also nice to say that the countries which are, you know, so far developing countries are supposed to be graduated like Philip was mentioning, but who is going to determine those criteria for a country to be developing? Especially I think after the COVID-19 crisis, because so many countries have been in trouble economically as well, I think it will be very difficult to now impose these new criteria and requests from developing countries to give up from their uh, treaty given rights to be self you know determination so therefore something has to be probably uh, negotiated with those countries in order for them to give up from something that has been provided through the treaties so which means we may need to change the treaty instead of asking to the countries to unilaterally declare that they now have graduated so it seems to me that this is an important and difficult matter to achieve. Another important matter I find is, of course, we've been talking about this for ages and ages, but the regionalism. And the regionalism in the sense that nobody has mentioned, I guess, if please correct me if I made a mistake, uh, you know, the speakers before me about the RCEP. To me, one of the most you know, brilliant factors of last year was the sig signature of the RCEP, where they wonderfully laid out a mechanism for the rules of origin, very flexible rules of origin. Why is this important? Because we have seen again in COVID-19 crisis, 
that you know the countries were trying to have access to the you know global supply chains and when you are trying to have access to the global supply chains the rules of origin in a free trade agreement becomes very important so in a situation where within the world trade organization we cannot achieve you know results through negotiations if the countries are you know having recourse to such advanced trade agreements such as rcep which is a wonderful example for at least you know the rules of origin content i think you know we may be asking ourselves i mean if i can achieve it already within a regional trade agreement why do i care to achieve it within the world trade organization and again, I will join Philip in saying here that, you know, Asia Pacific is crucial, you know, over the next years, I think we will be seeing a tremendous uh, strengthening of China, especially after RCEP. So within that, you know, uh, within that perspective, I will find it very interesting to see both European Union and the United States in their negotiations with China how can you sign a new agreement or how can you bring new disciplines without actually addressing or committing to certain things with China, knowing that it really became the hub in Asia Pacific, which also became a very important region during the you know, COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, another field that is very important, I find in the EU trade policy that will occupy us quite a bit of a time. I think this, uh, and again, you know, Philip rightly mentioned as well, I would like just to, you know, point, uh, touch upon a little bit, you know, during the Brexit negotiations, this level playing field. We know that competition law has been one of the Singapore issues, and then we had to leave the competition disciplines. But perhaps, you know, by looking at the, you know, new agreements which are being signed by the European Union, and also I see, you know, in some of the uh, campaign documents which have been mentioned by the, you know, Biden-Harris administration in the United States, this level playing field idea could perhaps turn into bringing new disciplines in the World Trade Organization, which is akin to competition law, which for, you know, for plenty of years of time of course the developing countries and least developed countries did not want to be on board but knowing that now in many of these you know full-fledged trade agreements bilateral and regional trade agreements we see the european union especially putting those you know provisions into the agreements like you know in south korea the labor provisions or uh, you know the environmental provisions or gender provisions so actually you know this shows us that there is a need for this level playing field and to the extent we can make it part of the international trading regulation and the rule book within the context of competition i think you know it is inevitable that we will also need to talk about that and the uh, again the climate change I think one of the most important things that is ahead for us, of course, it's not one of the shortest deliverables. And when you read the latest uh, declarations by Dr. Ngozi, she does not mention, of course, the climate change in one of the you know short deliverables until, until MC12. But we know that it's going to be very important for both European Union because it's you know at the heart of their trade policy. But also the you know Biden Harris administration through the transatlantic agenda, of course they will try to focus on that. But it was very interesting for me to read uh, the news or uh, in the newspapers over the last couple of days after uh, United States Special Envoy John Kerry left Brussels. He said that he is very concerned about European Union's border carbon adjustment and that uh, tackling the climate change, a uh, way to tackle the climate change should not be found in the uh, border carbon adjustment. So from that angle, uh, the point I would like to make is that during the Trump administration, President Trump administration, we have seen in international trade the usage, a lot of the security exception, and this is no secret to none of us. Many countries are now litigating against the United States for Section 232 disputes under the security exception. To me, the way in which perhaps we're going to see over the next years the European Union's new Green Deal and perhaps border carbon adjustment, the focused usage of Article 20 general exception and some other tools that will be played all along. 
So to me, after four years of security exception and dealing with how to navigate through the security exception, to me, it's very promising to see over the next years that we may actually, you know, uh, going into a direction to the extent the other countries are not going to be on the same board with the European Union for Green Deal and border carbon adjustment, we may see an expansive interpretation of Article 20, whether it would cover border tax adjustments and, of course, other uh, disciplines which are involved, the subsidies and counterweighting measures um, for non-tariff barriers, technical barriers to trade, because there will be lots of technical regulations and standards that the European Union will bring into life. Therefore, I think, you know, for the, until the MC12, the most important thing that we can be on board, if, of course, if there's a miracle for fisheries subsidies, agricultural subsidies, but I think the SNDT treatment, knowing that we are not even in the aftermath of the COVID-19, it is very difficult to convince the developing countries to give up from their developing country status, knowing that there is this divide among the countries for vaccination. There is divide in how to have access to the food and you know, the rights of the countries to these very essential uh, values. I think it will be very difficult. And one of the things that I would like to, again, pick up on what uh, Professor Sajar Dutti said for dispute settlement purposes, he said some of the cases are too high profile politically and sensitive. Perhaps they should not be brought before the WTO dispute settlement. So the question which comes to my mind, who is going to determine what is this most highly political agenda? It comes to me uh, like the Section 232 cases, of course, one can always cite. But you know, one of the elements, again, if there's a dispute between two WTO members related to the health matters or COVID-19, I can you know, also cite the dispute, although I'm not going to mention anything in detail, the dispute between Turkey and the European Union for pharmaceuticals. Now, can we say this is a highly political matter in the aftermath or during the pandemic? So it is vital for a country to tackle these questions. So we should you know, leave the country to tackle the health crisis by bringing you know, certain measures which will try to help their citizens. So to me, this is very difficult to say that certain cases are highly political, so let's not bring them to the WTO. So if we do not bring them to the WTO, where do we bring them? So here, I would like to leave you two cases. Uh, the European Union successfully pleaded against Korea uh, in the Korea-European uh, Union Free Trade Agreement for labor disputes which of course are not within the World Trade Organization. But for instance, the European Union did not opt for bringing uh, a dispute against Turkey for pharma dispute within the uh, Turkey EU Customs Union. They preferred the World Trade Organization dispute settlement. So I think one of the things that we will need to also find out this, you know, uh, where do we go for disputes? Do we go to the World Trade Organization st still? Or are we going to see more RTAs, dispute settlement functions to be used in the upcoming period, knowing that the MPIA does not have enough members for the time being? Thank you very much. I think I'm out of my time and I'm looking forward to further discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much for your thoughts, um, Pinar. Um, now I will give the floor to our special rapporteur. Eva Carvaleira, uh, who's the Deputy Head of Unit for Latin America at the DG Trade in the European Commission. Please, Eva, you have the floor. Thank you, Edna. And, um, and I'd like to also thank Elsa for having me at this webinar. Um, as rapporteur to this excellent pool of speakers, I will provide a summary to the best of my capacity <laughs> on all that has been said here today. As you said at the beginning, some food for thought. Um, as uh, we know, the subject of the seminar is the role of the WTO in addressing global challenges. Um, we have heard from our eminent speakers that have provided the European perspective, uh, perspective on the matter. We, we have heard more from the EU, also from a neighboring country, from Turkey. Uh, and uh, they have outlined the reasons why it is important to revitalize the system. I think we can say that all the speakers agree that the WTO 
can and, and should play a central role in an open and rules-based trading system. I don't know how our um, listeners here today feel about um, about the discussion. I feel reinvigorated. I've been a big, good number of, um, of ideas floated. Also a little bit of pessimism when we discuss the kind of main challenges that the organization has today, because some of them seem Bit of a catch 22 sometimes a bit of a, an unsurmountable an if, if we look at the books uh, sometimes as someone said i think it's not so much the institution but the software uh, of the members that maybe need to be reset uh, and that might be a challenge in the times and that run uh, i think um such a dotty professor such said it very well today trade relations uh, have become increasingly politicized um, that's clear i mean we've seen it in the trade wars between the the us and china and we have also seen it uh, all the more kind of emphasized with COVID. Mm, uh, there is a growing trend to protectionism there is a growing trend to take uh, unilateral measures uh, be because of uh situation we are in which is a situation of, of great concern for the health of our citizens being also because we need to revitalize our economies and in that sense uh, probably that will imply a great deal of state intervention with what that implies. Um, I think uh, deglobalization was flagged, growing unilateralism was also flagged by Ambassador Machado and Mr. Debar. I think we realize there is a certain level of global uncertainty, which is exactly what the WTO was supposed to, to address, and, and it seems to have been able to address during the pandemic. I think there have been many good things done at WTO great deal of cooperation between between members, uh, especially transparency that was uh, particularly important, but also facilitation of trade. But we also see that today, and that has been flagged by all the speakers, the, the, the rules uh, are obsolete. Um, the, the rules have been created <clears throat> more than a quarter of a century ago. They are not able to address the global challenges of the day. And that has caused uh, members to, of course, increase, I mean, since the 90s, the number of FTAs, uh, free trade agreements, bilaterally or regional agreements uh, over time, and to resort to other means to uh, kind of uh, use trade as lever for, for other values uh, like labor and environment. That has also been flagged. The EU has included and also the partners more and more these aspects in their agreements. The WTO has offered not a proper forum to discuss these issues at multilateral level for perhaps I would say lack of engagement of, of members or the difficulty of negotiating on this on these aspects and the fact uh, that we have to operate on the basis of consensus. I think this is one of the aspects that everybody flagged as a main hindrance of the organization today, uh, in particular the consensus for the decision and making a function. I think uh, we would say that um, there are many challenges affecting the organization. I think I have addressed mainly the external challenges, uh, the geopolitics, uh, the fact that we had COVID. Uh, and as uh, Dr. Arpiran said, I think the arrival of the pandemic really worsened the pre existing conditions. I think there had been long standing trends that with COVID had been uh, really amplified. I think uh, unilateralism and also the, the, the sluggish growth of our economies. This is something that COVID only accentuated. We had a pretty negative trend before, before the pandemic. But I think there are also the internal challenges that the speakers have flagged. Uh, they spoke of the negotiating function of the WTO. They spoke of the oversight function of the WTO, and they spoke also of the dispute settlement function of the WTO. I heard many good initiatives, good ideas. Uh, of course, uh, I think as we all agree or seem to agree, the main uh, preoccupation is the negotiating function. I think we need new rules and pro perhaps not only new rules, but we need to as uh, speakers said, um, revise existing rules on uh, subsidization or on anti-dumping. We need to revise the special and differential treatment. I think there is a, a growing sense that it's not working as it was supposed to work. And uh, we need to add new issues to the rule book. And I think that they are the Commission, the European Union has come with uh, useful initiatives, uh, be it on the health initiative of Soleil or the MPIA to sort of address the, the problems on dispute settlement. I think there was a growing sense that maybe more initiatives, I need to, yes, summarize. So more initiatives uh, are needed. 
and uh, and otherwise uh, allowed for the uh, members to uh, discuss these issues in smaller groups in plurilateral uh, settings if not all members of the organization are willing or capable of uh, at this stage engage uh, otherwise uh, i think i gather from the discussion that uh, members would be more pushed towards unilateral or to dealing to have their dealings on FTAs or regional agreements if the organization cannot serve as forum to address what is more uh, becoming more linked uh, to trade these days, which are issues that are not only the interests or economic interests, but also values such as labor or environment or climate. I will not give a complete without of the uh, different uh, initiatives. I hope that uh, the listeners have taken good note. I think they're good uh, initiatives being flagged. Uh, I would think just to conclude with um, with the thing what I uh, was important from the EU perspective and, and some of you flagged, okay, we are an important market. We are a geopolitical dwarf, that's clear. And we definitely need to uh, diversify relations and build alliances. I, I believe that that's a, consensus that are between the speakers. We need to closely cooperate with partners, that's for sure, uh, US, but also China. Uh, we harbor great hopes with the new administration, and we hope that through this we can uh, tackle one of the issues that worries the EU, I guess, also the US the most, which is level playing field, especially between market economies and state economies. And with that, I hope I manage with the 11 minutes. And um, sorry if I didn't capture all the ideas that you uh, flagged, but that would be my summary with a little time <laughs> I had to prepare. Yeah. Thank you. Splendorous. Um... Thank you very much, Iva. Now I will give some minutes to the speakers to comment on each other's presentations. So who would like to, to start to take the floor? Professor Sacerdoti, please. You're muted, Professor. You're muted. Sorry, I was very pleased to hear the following intervention. I mean, uh, revitalizing not just the legislative function at the WTO, but intervening also the members in dispute settlement to to facilitate the role of pan as an appellate body and not giving them uh, difficult issues, as it was mentioned, to with the old rule book to decide on green subsidies, for instance, or, or things like that. It's easier, of course, said than, than, than adopted, because if there is remand to the members, the members, the the interpretation function, I would welcome it. Uh, uh, the, the, the members would draw out, as we say in Italy, the chestnut out of the fires for the adjudicators. Only, not only at the WTO internationally, but also nationally. We know how often uh, uh, Supreme Courts have to decide cases uh, very delicate on, on health, on life issues and so on that they would prefer and sometimes they give to parliament, say, okay, you decide, but if after one or two years you don't decide, we have to decide the dispute before us. And the board goes back to the, to the adjudicators. So maybe the majority should be, should be like uh, binding interpretations can be adopted by three quarters of the members, but the members never wanted to go that way. They haven't even tried. I mean, no one had even, put on the on the agenda of the DSB something. So, okay, try to do it and uh, responsabilize, make more responsible uh, the members. Maybe there is also, the ambassador would know better, WTO Geneva is somehow remoted from the capital. It's not enough that the ambassador and the advisors engage. It should be the capital that we the negotiators and starts on some of these issues, but of course in the capitals there are many other pressing issues. Okay, that was my 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 basic um, comment, and I agree with uh, 
Philip, that you should be, let's say, more bold, but also going a unilateral way if negotiations don't succeed and promote a national agenda. We know uh, it's not easy, but then you will be attacked and then it's difficult to challenge other countries that would go the same way. China now with uh, rare earths, the US on various items, if you yourself are pursuing that way. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Perhaps uh, Ambassador Joao? Thank you. Uh, well, I agree with most of what uh, was said. Uh, by uh, Philippe de Bar uh, and also Dr. Uh, Artiran uh, and uh, Professor uh, Sacerdoti. Uh, it's true that uh, uh, authoritative interpretations have never been tried uh, in the WTO. One thing that I think we should probably spend a bit of time thinking is the consensus rule should it be used as unanimity? I mean, the threshold for blocking has become quite low and not very costly. And I think uh, some discussion and some thinking about it, why you have a consensus rule, does it mean that anyone can raise a flag and block everything? So could we work around that and put some uh, constraining uh, elements on the use of the consensus. Uh, I think it's uh, an area that has not yet been very much explored and probably some thinking into it could be interesting uh, while preserving the consensus rule uh, to our put uh, some uh, uh, basic markers that it is not uh, used too lightly or abusive. Uh, that I think is something that we should think about. Otherwise, I think that uh, more and more we need to make the case and politically for uh, letting those members who want uh, to proceed quicker to do it. I mean, otherwise it's the whole organization that will be uh, completely paralyzed. What is, I see there is one question, what is the EU approach for special in differential treatment? We, in, in our communication, we suggest that G20 economies take full commitments. Uh, and then uh, for the others, for the other, we, uh, we are okay with least developed countries to have a very special treatment. But for the other developing countries, that this should be done on the basis of uh, a need, uh, a specific need, and on a, a factual basis depending on the sector, what are the difficulties a country has to implement an obligation? And then we discuss what is the special differential treatment that is needed. It will be more, uh, require more dialogue, more understanding, but the situation right now is the following. You have a group among the membership that when you start a negotiation, they don't invest any time of effort in negotiating the rules they invest time and effort in escaping the rules. They are not there to say, look, this rule is okay, but it creates me a difficulty for that and that reason. No, the basic, the point of departure is if there is that rule, I'm a developing country, so I'm fully exempted. This is extremely perversive and, uh, uh, and frustrates uh, the efforts of any negotiation. And I think it's important to be clear uh, because uh, we should not uh, be confusing. In my view, the problem has not been China so much. Of course, here you have to deal with one thing. China maintains that it is a developing country because it is in the Communist Party manifesto and the China who wants to be a leader of the developing world. But China is big enough to negotiate what it needs. China is not going to rely on, I want an exemption because I'm a developing country. They have the muscle to negotiate what they need. And you have not seen, I mean, even if you look at the accession of China, well, they obtained some special, I would say semi-special and differential treatment on the agriculture, on the de minimis, 
uh, where uh, developed countries got 5% of production, uh, developing countries 10% uh, in the Uruguay round, China got 8.5%. Uh, uh, the rest, the level of commitment, were negotiated and China can deal with it. But China is not prepared to give up the denomination of being a developing country for political reasons. Uh, and and here, I think the problem lies more in some other G20 economies. Uh, if you look at the economies I've mentioned, like India, South Africa, and others, that are clearly, the mindset is still, and that's, I think that is important at some point that we also have a discussion among the membership. The mindset is still, what is behind this idea of special international treatment is that trade is bad. And I want to be a member and I want to be integrated of the, in, inter, in the international trading system, but I don't want to take obligations. I mean, how can you be integrated if you are sitting on the fence? You, you will never be integrated. China wants to be integrated because China knows that the system is beneficial. It's a major trader and China knows the value of the WTO system. I mean, uh, China has absorbed the WTO system. The WTO system has not yet absorbed China, which is a different, a different discussion. But you don't. You, the point of departure is not. Uh, I want to be exempted because I need policy space. It's all this discussion of the policy space. I mean, I want to keep policy space for my development. Well, but the debate is does being part of an international trading system is good or not for your economic development. If you take the view that it is mostly bad, then you want policy space and stay outside. And there is a divide among the membership. This is the background for all this discussion on special differential treatment. Thank you. So I guess then it's my turn, Edna. <laughs> Please. Thank you, okay. um, let me maybe first address uh, what uh, Professor Sacerdoti just mentioned. Is uh, uh, my call for unilateral action by the EU is not a call to take action violating the WTO. Uh, my call for unilateral action is more one of saying where there are no multilateral rules and where there are issues which are not dealt with with the WTO sufficiently. Uh, let's take uh, unilateral action if we cannot achieve at a multilateral or a plurilateral solution. Uh, in fact, such multilateral action, uh, such indivi uh, uh, individual action, uh, unilateral action, uh, could be seen as a call for uh, a getting a start to uh, international negotiations. Uh, I give as an example the, the uh, current discussions on the digital tax, uh, where unilateral measures are used a bit as a stick to go forward in the OECD negotiations. Uh, so you could, you could see unilateral action as a way of uh, uh, forcing countries to enter into negotiations on issues which are not addressed or not sufficiently addressed. Um, in a number of cases, and, and I, I, I would like to go back to what uh, Pinar mentioned, uh, we need to take indeed action for the de defense of public health, uh, defense of the environment, uh, which is not, which is action which is not sufficiently covered by the existing agreements. And in that sense, we, we feel obliged to invoke Article 20 or in extreme situations, Article 21. Uh, but let's let's look at Article 20, where we would uh, uh, try to um, justify export restrictions, for instance, for vaccines, uh, or uh, where we would uh, uh, try to justify discriminatory measures in the relation of imports of of goods which we consider that are bad for uh, for global for the climate change, so that we uh, carbon intensive products or the imposition of a carbon border adjustment mechanism. Uh, Increasingly, we could just try to justify this under Article 20. In my view, that's not that's a stopgap solution, and it should not be the definitive solution, because otherwise we risk uh, making Article 20 so wide uh, that there's a risk that the exceptions will swallow the rule. 
uh, we, plus if the case is brought before the dispute settlement body, we will basically force the dispute settlement body and the appellate body uh, to be creative and to start uh, or, or to rely on what the Americans call judicial activism, uh, trying to accommodate justified concerns of public health and environment under these old rules of the WTO. So Article 20, Article 21 is, is a stopgap solution. Uh, but it should not replace international negotiations on environment, on public health, etc. And an, an issue which we haven't discussed, but I thought it was important to raise it, is the sequencing. Uh, what do we address first? The dispute settlement body or the negotiating function? Um, the Americans, I understand, are in favor of addressing the negotiation function first. Uh, the EU, uh, in my view, rightly, points out to the fact that it's very difficult to negotiate rules if you're not if you don't know to what extent they will be enforceable through dispute settlement. Uh, so there is a big discussion, a big discussion there, especially because in my view, you cannot solve the crisis of the dispute settlement mechanism without uh, tinkering or reforming at least uh, the negotiation function and the consensus rule in the uh, in the in the uh, of, in the, in the decision making process of the membership and there i, I refer to what professor sacerdoti said about the uh, uh, the fact that actually in authoritative interpretations could be adopted by a three fourth majority but the membership has been reluctant to uh, go that way so these are my final thoughts on this uh, at least for today Wonderful. Thank you very much. Now I give the floor to Pinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edna. Um, I think I can only uh, add a couple of things to what the previous speakers have, you know, very rightly mentioned. Uh, on the idea, I fully agree with Ambassador Machado. Of course, I see the difficulty in relation to SNDT treatment, and so you know, for so many years, uh, the membership had to face certain, you know, inequality between the members, where actually they are perfectly able to, you know, negotiate certain things but on the other hand, do not accept obligations. I hear that, but I think I still am of the view that this has to be done through negotiations and through changing the text of the treaty, because as long as the existing norms are in the treaty, I think it's a little bit you know, unfair to expect the countries to unilaterally give up from whatever they have been given through the rule book. And it would not be a good example for other you know, concessions that we would be expecting from the members. Therefore, the best way to do this is to agree on some criteria, common principles, and if possible, change the treaties. On the other hand, one of the things that I find very important is, again, in, in relation to European Union Green Deal, which I find very important. And we know that this is going to be also very important for many countries, also for China, which seems to be on board with the European Union on you know, fighting against climate change. And also we understand from the, the CHI, uh, the Comprehensive Investment Agreement between European Union and China. But one thing will be very important for all countries in the World Trade Organization is the financing. You know, in order to be able to trade with the European Union or trade with the United States or any country which takes on board environmental concerns, we will need serious financing mechanism. So therefore, knowing that, you know, we're trying this organization to be as inclusive as possible, because yes, there are many countries which are developing and least developed countries in this organization. And we know that the global welfare will only be achieved if everybody can trade with each other. So inclusiveness will also require some, you know, basic funding on the uh, on the finance uh, one, of the, uh, one of the challenges that we will need to address is to find you know perhaps some financing mechanism and perhaps uh, the wto also has to uh, conduct some you know talks you know, would be the right uh, person to you know try to perhaps generate certain, you know, financing possibilities for, uh, you know, trying to adjust ourselves into the, you know, challenges which come with the climate change. Uh, one thing until uh, MC12, an important thing that perhaps we can try to agree on mm -hmm. is the idea of domestic support. 
uh, for subsidies, I think this is going to be the main important topic that we will need to tackle, not only from the Chinese perspective, but for many countries which are putting into place subsidies. So therefore, if you know, at MC12 countries can achieve a consensus or a common understanding on you know, to adopt similar approaches to both the domestic, you know, agricultural subsidies as well as industrial subsidies, I think that would be already a good start. But in order to do that, uh, I think, you know, the burning question, uh, I keep coming to the same topic, you know, we really need to find an answer for SNDT treatment for countries, knowing that so many flexibilities are embedded into the covered agreements. And I find it for the time being difficult but you know, in case we can give certain other you know benefits to the you know developing countries which are not going to graduate, so to say, as Philip was saying, perhaps we can find a common denominator. But as it stands today, the rule book, I find it very hard for the countries to uh, to give up from that you know SNDT treatment. That will be my last contribution, Edna. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pinar. Um, I think we have a question uh, from the audience. Uh, this is Valentin Badert. Uh, he is uh, mentioning that, or uh, with a, uh, he mentioned the following question. Uh, with the new Biden administration, what will be the role of the EU as mediator between US and China? Perhaps Ambassador Aguiar? Thank you. Well, uh, we don't have the ambitions to be a mediator between the US and China. They are big enough. Uh, we hope that we can bring a measure of uh, uh, some reasonableness to, to the discuss. It's clear that uh, you need uh, to persuade China that some rules need to change on subsidies, on uh, competitive neutrality, uh, even if the current system uh, serves well China, it's not sustainable. And uh, I think the Chinese we are, 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 are persons that are pragmatic uh, and they see that if they want the system to continue to serve them, it's in their interest also to come around and to have that discussion. So uh, we don't uh, have ambition to be mediator there, but we uh, want to play our full part. We have similar concerns as uh, the United States have uh, with, rely, uh, with regard to subsidies. Uh, so this will need to be done. But, and I hear if you allow me, I pick very quickly what uh, Dr. Uh, Artiram just said. We need to be uh, measured in our approach. We cannot put everything on MC12. I mean, we have had four years without a ministerial meeting of the WTO, and the last one was not a success. The risk, the big risk that we have is that everyone unloads on the table all their preferred topics. And this would be a perfect recipe for another disaster. So I think with a new director general now in place, we need to be ambitious but modest on what can we reap at MC12, but more important, we need to have a solid work program going forward. And a work program that includes certainly agriculture, domestic support, uh, uh, a work program that re includes restoring the dis uh, fully functioning dispute settlement, a work program that includes dealing with subsidies on industry, uh, the competitive neutrality, climate change. These needs to be, uh, the discussion needs to be how to carry this work in the next two, three years. And if we have a modest success in December in terms of, let's say, fish subsidies or trade and health, because it's a very important, most topical issue right now, then the new director general can come out very emboldened with new trust among the members and can take us forward in a, this agenda. But if we bring domestic support which we have not been able to negotiate in the last four, five, six years, and we are only eight months away with a new US administration coming in. Uh, we need to be very uh, mod while ambitious, but with a big dose of modesty if we want to bring this organization back again on the right track. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Ambassador. I guess I do have a, a question uh, for Ambassador Joao as well. Uh, in the, there are like three main facts, uh, the trade and health initiative of the EU, uh, then the export restrictions of COVID vaccines of the, uh, from the EU, and then this concern that uh, was led by Colombia and other Latin American countries, and my understanding that many more others joined this concern towards these restrictions. So uh, my question is the following, uh, are the EU restrictions and the WTO or IP, WTO IP rules the problem or to the problem to provide this access to, uh, to the market or is it the insufficient production of the vaccines or what is the real, uh, um, the real answer behind these uh, restrictions that it is a uh, 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 difficult thing to understand because uh, the EU has been a tremendous supporter of the uh, multilateral rules-based system. So uh, perhaps there is a progress uh, inside of the EU uh, to eliminate them, or I don't know what is the dynamic and the response that you have had uh, for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, it's a big issue, uh, a big, uh, and it's a, a big political issue that goes much further than a purely legal issue. But even from a legal point of view, I want to put one or two points. Uh, in our proposal in the Ottawa Group on Trade and Health, we also put a section on export restrictions, which allows export restrictions, but they need to be proportionate, time limited, uh, and uh, not be discriminatory. And uh, so even uh, in our Trade and Health proposal, uh, we do not uh, make a ban on export restrictions, uh, like the basic discipline of WTO. Export restrictions can be used in, in certain uh, uh, cases. But I understand uh, it's uh, a question of optics uh, that uh, in the EU uh, as is part of this initiative and at the same time puts in place an export authorization scheme that now it was supposed to uh, go until the end of this month and now was extended until the 31st of june or 30th of june uh, this year uh, it creates uh, concerns among our partners and i see it here uh, first 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 uh, stage in geneva with our and it was put in a, a submission by uh, colombia by chile uh, uruguay and others which i i fully understand but what is the exact situation there is a lack of vaccines around the world there is not enough production of vaccines the production capacity or what is coming out of, of the manufacturing is not enough. Companies over-promised and under-delivered. And this is a situation that we have right now. So when the EU, we have had a problem with a specific company, uh, which made a contract, an advanced purchasing agreement with the EU, and is not delivering. And the EU put this regime in place, essentially to track where the vaccines are going. Because if you read the European press, you see that governments are completely on ease when they see around the world others are vaccinating much higher percentages. And in, in the EU, where we have the main manufacturing pharma industry, we have not been able to vaccinate enough people. Is this a reason to be protectionists or to be vaccine, to enter into vaccine nationalism? I don't think the EU is vaccine nationalism. Let me tell you one figure. Of all the vaccines that have been produced in the EU and around the world, the major producers are EU, UK, US. Of all the vaccines that have been produced until now in the EU, 53% have been exported. 53%. So you can understand politically, or this can become explosive. And the one shipment from Italy of 2,000, uh, 200, 500, uh, 50,000 to Australia was blocked on the reasons that Australia, I am not justifying, but that's the factual case. Since the 1st of January, there has been no deaths of COVID in Australia. Hospitals are not full. 
which is good. They have managed very well. No one is blaming in any way. But in Europe, you have in situations in Italy that people are in very difficult situations. So politically, it, it's very explosive and you have to manage. But I really contest that this is vaccine nationalism because the figures do not support that. And a final point, interesting enough, none of vaccines is coming out of the UK or from the US. The US invoked the Defense Production Act. So everything produced in UK stays in, in US stays in the US. United Kingdom made an agreement with AstraZeneca that everything that is produced there is first supplied to the UK market. These are not export restrictions because these are parts of deals with the companies. <laughs> we adopted export restrictions and of course everyone is focusing on that, and uh, we duly notified straight away the WTO three days later. But it's not because we notified that we can claim that we are clean. I'm not. I'm not suggesting that. But this is a very highly politically charged situation. And until now, the regime started on the first of February. There was only that case from Italy that was not exported, and uh, no other single case so far. And I hope that remains largely the situation. So to give you uh, an overview of the politics behind this. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. I also have a question for all the uh, speakers. Uh, regarding this, um, it was mentioned that uh, through plurilateralism, it could be one of the solutions to advance these negotiations. However, recently at the General Council meeting, uh, there was this statement of I, uh, India and South Africa regarding uh, the legal status of the joint statement initiatives, that they don't recognize it as uh, plurilateral, uh, and they say that this, their legal status or the status of this uh, joint statement initiatives are cannot be considered and contravene the WTO. They provide solutions. One of them was the flexibility uh, when negotiating, or, uh, so, so flexibility or, uh, when negotiating <laughs> treaties um, or something similar, and also the traditional ways of uh, incorporating this, uh, uh, reaching the consensus that we know we have been extremely difficult, uh, and the other traditional ways on how to modify the agreements. So, um, is, do you have any views on these statements or ways on how these uh, statements can be um, uh, reconciled with the, with the current situation? I mean, we need to make progress in the negotiations. We don't, the legal, uh, uh, is, it is very difficult to reach consensus as we have seen it. Plurilaterals could be an option, but then there are some members that disagree with these plurilaterals. Uh, your views are more than welcome. Anyone, or we, if we are cornering Ambassador Joao again. <laughs> Sorry, Ambassador. Well, I would say, uh, briefly, uh, the Indian South African paper raised a number of legal issues. Uh, uh, some of them, I don't think, are uh, fully uh, correct. For example, if you take the uh, General Agreement on Trade in Services, it is clearly said there that uh, multilateral negotiations on, uh, negotiations on services will be advanced on bilateral, plurilateral, and multilateral uh, formats. So even in the agreement, the GATS agreement already mentions plurilaterals. And secondly, in the, in the, in the, the, the services agreement, the GATS, you have ways of incorporating uh, commitments through what we call additional commitments. So nothing prevents a group of, of 20, 60 countries to add to their commitments through additional commitments. Of course, this would be applied MFN. So, but I think the basic point is, this is not a legal discussion. We know what are the obligations to add to Article uh, Annex 4, it needs to be done by consensus. This is a political discussion that we need to have first. And the political discussion is, if you want the WTO to continue to be, to survive and be relevant, we need to allow different approaches to negotiations. And once we get agreement on the politics of it, then we will adjust the legal uh, ways of accommodating it. Uh, but it is not essentially a legal issue. 
it's a political discussion that the members need to have if they want this organization to remain uh, relevant. Wonderful. I don't know if Professor Sacerdoti wants to uh, take a, okay, perfect. So we have a last question uh, before we go to uh, concluding remarks. Oh, Ambassador Santiago Wills, he's the ambassador uh, of Colombia. Ado, are, uh, he's um, mentioning excellent remarks uh, from all the speakers. Uh, thank you for organizing this webinar and good luck. Um, so he has been uh, supporting and uh, following on this uh, webinars. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And we have a last question uh, for uh, from Anna, Anna Kailini. I apologize for my bad pronunciation, sorry. Um, so, as given the progress made in fisheries subsidies negotiations and investment facilitation, can we foresee an outcome of negotiations? Um, could we uh, envisage an agreement uh, made by the next ministerial? Well, I, I, I think this is a question we should ask Santiago. <laughs> <laughs> Santiago <laughs> had it in the, in the ambassador Santiago had it in the in the in his previous uh, had a similar question in his pre, in the previous webinar, and um, he was quite positive. Of course, like the first meeting that the uh, new uh, appointed uh, newly appointed director general had was with precisely with him as chairman of the of the fisheries uh, subsidies negotiations. But uh, so so they, they are, uh, members are working on this and, and yeah, and I don't know if it's foreseeable or it's too early to ask uh, something like this or are there many difficulties in the, on the ground? Uh, I don't know. Perhaps Ambassador Aguiar wants to comment on this. <laughs> Ambassador? Okay. Well, <laughs> uh, well uh, first, investment facilitation, we are not aiming to conclude in MC12. We are aiming to have a clean uh, text uh, that we can, uh, after, uh, after December, uh, go for the final stretch of the negotiations. So it's not on the cards to conclude investment in December. Fish subsidies, we must do it. We have been 20 years negotiating these. And for uh, the European Union, fishery subsidies negotiations is a test case of the ability of the WTO to deal with sustainability issues. Because what is at stake in the negotiation is not the subsidy that I give to my vessel is an advantage in relation to another country's vessel. The subsidy that I give to my vessel is destroying the stock of fish or not. So it's a test case of our ability to deal with sustainability. If we cannot do it after 20 years, then forget about climate change and all these other topics. So we must do it and we must finish it and then pass to another, a new era where you address uh, a number of other issues that we need to address in this organization. And we count very much on uh, the efforts and steer of Ambassador Wills uh, to take us to good port. Since we are in fisheries, we need to arrive at a good port uh, in December. Thank you very much. So I can proceed. It has been an extremely enlightening uh, discussion. Thank you very much. I would like to just mention a couple of um, concluding remarks. Uh, it has been said that indeed uh, the WTO can be a solution to solve certain global challenges. Uh, and some of them, are, as it has been mentioned, like obviously the crisis that we're experimenting with COVID-19, the access of vaccines, it, it is one of the main and most important challenges uh, that the WTO is focusing, that the members are, are focusing on solving it or uh, trying to, to address it in, in certain ways. 
Obviously, climate change has been highlighted and food security, as uh, Pinar also highlighted, is one of the uh, global challenges that, uh, that can, is, is another global challenge that can be tackled through the WTO. Then the main issue here is to find a balance. This is how um, uh, uh, Jennifer Hillman, former uh, uh, Appellate Body uh, member, mentioned it before and today Philippe mentioned it as an equilibrium to find this equilibrium and everything everybody has mentioned it in a way right between the legislative the judicial and obviously and obviously uh, the executive power so in the legislative we mentioned that is necessary new set of rules we said that and I I uh, I was very um I appreciate very much the the comment and the the the, this uh, uh, of Ambassador uh, Aguiar Machado that uh, perhaps it's better not to be too ambitious, but just finding the right means uh, for uh, revitalizing this rules-based system. Uh, so uh, we talked about certain uh, specific rules, right? On um, from digital trade to uh, uh, to a lot of specific issues that have been sequencing and a lot of specific issues that can be dealt at a, uh, at a normative level. And then we also have uh, this uh, very important issue of finding new ways to agree on this uh, on this set of rules. So we have the plurilaterals as a solution and that uh, it is it it seems to be the way forward uh, for uh, concluding this um, new set of rules. Then the judicial level, we talked about, uh, obviously we have this paralysis and uh, in nominating the appellate body members and the discussion goes between uh, having one or two stages uh, at the dispute settlement system uh, or preserving it, or if we have these two stages also, as uh, Professor Sacerdoti mentioned it, whether it is necessary to adjust in the sense of which are the disputes that should be uh, included or uh, or uh, whether we are, are going to start uh, differentiating these political ones from others that are more uh, uh, legal uh, issues. And then also it was mentioned that uh, by Philippe that also the type of um, uh, um, appellate body members could be more uh, 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 selected in a way that they uh, are problem solvers, so that uh, that we can uh, manage and, and balance a little bit more the legal issue and the political issue, and how they will solve the the, the problems that are raised there. And also, it has been, uh, and, but and at the end of the day, as uh, as uh, Ambassador Machado said. Uh, we need a functioning dispute settlement system, and uh, the EU has a very clear uh, type of features that are included there, such as a binding agreement, um, and then uh, and then many many other features that are uh, included in, in the EU policy. And obviously, the MPIA is still there, uh, and it can be an option, and it has worked for some members. And obviously, when we're, uh, what could be expected in, in the event, uh, it is not solve this issue that perhaps the U.S. Uh, joins or, uh, or sets a specific requirements uh, for this uh, or uh, agrees that this MPIA functions in a way. Uh, even if, it, if they don't join, perhaps that they, uh, they, they contribute with the financing or uh, in, a, in, in any way, right? But it, that it makes it, it, it helps uh, the system to make it work as well. So this is the other option that exists already. And last but not least, the executive power. We have finally a new DG uh, and the role of the secretariat that it could be enhanced. Uh, the DG has said it uh, many times that perhaps through uh, they can help more the members uh, through uh, with their transparency issues. And now Ambassador Machado also mentioned some issues how the secretariat that is highly qualified can contribute more in this uh, in the solution of this crisis. And then, uh, so then on the one hand, we have this balance. And then on the other hand, we have this addressing this uh, transversal, uh, transversal issues that go uh, like a special and differential treatment. And that is a, a key issue that needs to be solved that uh, PINAR uh, um, help us to uh, understand uh, in a, and see it in a different way, but also the needs that developed countries have 
for certain developing countries, and it was mentioned China, but others have uh, have been mentioned out there, uh, that perhaps the, it needs to be addressed differently, this issue uh, of special and differential treatment. No? And also Pinar asked, uh, uh, mentioned about the inclusiveness, uh, and the inclusiveness taking into account from the point of view of all the members uh, being able to enjoy this special and differential treated, uh, treatment. As I, I said in the former um, seminar, the trade facilitation agreement, that is the, the agreement that I worked the most on technical assistance project in, with different, directly with different members, has been considered as successful and it is a way uh, of uh, going forward with a special differential treatment. Just uh, a comment to say that it's important that members that are negotiating new uh, agreements, new set of rules, they take into account this very uh, um, functioning way of, uh, of including the SND. And then uh, also just the, the key roles that uh, the specific players are, are um, uh, having this uh, in this uh, crisis, and obviously the the EU, the US, and China keep coming up as the main uh, solver makers in a way. Uh, but of course, the whole membership it is important to uh, to to be part of this, and we start seeing leaderships. Uh, even with um, Latin American countries uh, that are putting up some proposals to fight for this uh, WTO rules basis, uh, rules based system. So uh, this this could be uh, the and then the main conclusion I should say that it has been, it has been said uh, if we don't find this uh, revitalization a revital, revitalization of the WTO rules-based system, then members, and particularly those that are developed members, will keep working regionally or bilaterally or even unilaterally. So this is the danger of not being able to reform and to have a successful reform of the WTO. So on my end, uh, I would like to thank again tremendously to our speakers, to the participants, and to everyone else that has joined uh, this uh, webinar from wherever they are in the world. Thank you very much.